This is Criteria. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miris. I'm here with my co-host, Nathan Douglas. Hello, Nathan. Hey, Thomas. And this is part two of our discussion of the Magisterium of Pope Pius XII as pertains to cinema. In part one, we discussed uh, the first part of his apostolic exhortation on the ideal film. We're going to finish that today and also touch on his uh, encyclical Miranda Prosus on film, radio, and television. So let's jump right into it. Let's go to part two. Uh, This was his audience in October 1955. We're not going to dwell on this uh, probably as at great length as the the first part. Um, But basically, he's continuing. Earlier, he had said that um, the ideal film can be viewed in relation to the subject, that is the spectator, in relation to the object, that is the content of the film, and in relation to the community. And in part one, he dealt with the spectator. And in this second, uh, this second audience, he dealt with uh, the content of the film and the community. And so let's get into it. Um, he, he makes kind of a funny, a funny comment at the beginning of part two. He says that um, cinema as an art and a diversion it would seem to be that it should be confined to the fringe of life, um, governed, of course, he says, quote, by the common laws which regulate ordinary human activities. But then he goes on to say that since it has taken on such a vast influence, it should be indra- addressed in particular. So this is why we're getting we're getting a particular uh, apostolic exhortation only on cinema. And he mentions that people's behavior in private and public life is actually being influenced by what they see on the screen. And then there's this quote, which I don't think requires much comment, but it's kind of prophetic, so I want to read it. In a tomorrow of spiritual and civic decadence, for which the undisciplined liberty of the film would share responsibility, what a reproof would rise therefrom against the wisdom of the men of today, as men who did not know how to direct an instrument so suited to the education and development of souls and instead left it to be turned into a vehicle of evil. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> so enough said on that. Obviously, the church tried, but things broke loose at a certain point. So, the ideal film considered in relation to the object or to its content. Here we get into the transcendentals. All right. So, quoting Pius the Twelfth here, insofar as the film has reference to man, it will be ideal in content to the extent that, in perfect, perfect and harmonious form, it measures up to the original and essential demands of man himself. Basically, these demands are three. Truth, goodness, beauty. Refractions, as it were, across the prism of consciousness of the boundless realm of being, which extends beyond man, in whom they actuate an ever more extensive participation in being itself. He's talking about, you know, morality, a lot and psychology in the first part but here he talks he he gets more universal truth goodness and beauty and that these uh when these refract across the prism of consciousness uh they they actuate in, in man an ever more extensive participation in being itself which is a big claim um and uh He goes on to say, quote, it is true that in individual cases, he who devotes himself through art and culture to provide man with a share in this realm becomes aware in the end of having very inadequately satisfied his insatiable thirst. Yet there remains to him the merit of having known how to divert to his advantage part of the stream of the original fullness of truth, goodness, and beauty in the measure of the possible and free from contaminations. And then he goes on to ask, can the film be a suitable vehicle for this triad, truth, goodness, and beauty, in the mind of the spectator? And he answers, yes. Um, so he goes on to talk about, in a very concrete way, the ways that this might be done in plots, in genres. And he says something interesting, and I may have mentioned this on the podcast before, which is that not every plot is possible to portray in film. Sometimes you'll hear people justifying um, some content in the film by it was it was necessary for the plot. And that may or may not be the case right on the level of the individual film. But I've often thought that, well, it may be the case that certain subject matters, you know, certain specific uh, subjects are actually just not able to be 
depicted in art or in a particular art form according to you know the tools that it has to work with and so um you know in, in a way that 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 i think that's a necessary recognition and i think it's one that should make artists humble in the sense that like we we are not capable of, of giving like a full comprehensive view of of reality um and that we we sometimes we have to bow either before the transcendent and what you know exceeds our limit or in prudence and morality before things that uh simply should not be discussed or should not be evoked or at the very least should not be portrayed visually um and that's sort of what pious says here he says quote not rarely obstacles are of an entirely practical nature interfere which check the filmmaker on the threshold of the ideal as for example the intrinsic impossibility of giving a visible representation to some truths goodness or beauty the film cannot presume nor should it run the risk of challenging plots which escape the control of the objective which cannot be reduced to images being rebels as it were to scenic representation for reasons either technical or artistic or because of other considerations, such as reasons of social or natural delicacy, of respect or of piety, or even of prudence and the safeguarding of human life. Yet in spite of these limitations, some intrinsic, others practical, the range of plots remains wide, rich, rewarding, and attractive, no matter what may be the element of the triad, which predominates in the individual film. Um, and so I think that's interesting. Um, I mean, both for the reasons that I just mentioned, that I mean, we, we should we should not be too greedy. You know, we should we should appreciate that the artists do not have infinite capability and infinite rights to portray whatever they want. And there's plenty for us to work with. You know, God has given us it's like every we've been given everything, ex every every fruit to eat, except for the fruit of the tree of the you know knowledge of good and evil. Like we can re eat of every fruit of the garden except that one. We have plenty of room uh, to be creative. And um, but the other thing he says is no matter what element of the triad predominates in the individual film. So I thought that was interesting, too, just because the idea that it could be truth or it could be goodness or it could be beauty. And again, that leaves I think that leaves room for a range of types of film. It leaves room for the didactic. It re leaves room for the sort of narrative and it re re leaves room for the aesthetic. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so much there. Um, I think it's. <laughs> We were speaking earlier about, um, you know, film. I, I was talking really about like films material is everything that can be photographed, everything that is in nature. Um, yeah. And I think often because we are recognized like that's like any, anything could in a way become a film. Um, you know, we don't or many filmmakers have kind of assumed that then. Yeah. Like, as you pointed out, that everything should become a film. And of course, as we know, um, you know, just from the, what the church has taught regarding, you know, depictions of sexuality, the marital act, um, uh, you know, as one example, probably the one that, that is most f foremost in people's minds about kind of like what is and isn't appropriate. Um, you know, that's something that I think a lot more work could be done by Catholic film theorists around, you know, why is that not, not only from the, obviously we, we have a, strong demonstration from the moral point of view and, and, um, and the magisterium of John Paul II, you know, going into the, the nature of, of the, of, of the marital relationship. Um, but how that relates to film, like how does that relate to photographing nature, you know, and what, what, what do we think that, um, you know, I, I think a lot of f f people would defend, you know, depicting the marital act, um, because it's real, you know, because it's like it's part of reality and it's like, oh, this is part of our this is part of our right of what what we get to to show. Um, and it's like, well, what do you really you know, if you're if you're trying to photograph something in order to capture or to uh, to mediate the essence uh, in some way of that thing, you know, are you able to actually have you checked to make sure that you're act that's actually what you're doing, you know? Um, and this is, this would obviously get into a lot more, you know, this could be its own conversation, but I'm just using it as an example where the thing that's fundamentally being mediated between husband and wife, is that something that can even actually be mediated, right. uh, to a film viewer? I would say right. absolutely not. You know, yeah. like even just on the photographic, the ontological level of kind of what is a photo, what is a moving picture, right. uh, it's defunct in that sense. And so that's, I think there's a, there's a ontological case there to be made for why yes. that should not be done, you know? Yes. Uh, and there's probably, there's certainly other 
other examples, you know, that aren't to do with that, that, that we could go into as well. Um, yep. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So from here, Pope Pius goes on to discuss uh, genres of films, uh, and we're not going to talk about most of those. He talks about educational documentaries a bit. He talks about plot plot based fiction movies a little bit. But what I want to focus on here in detail is the the short section on films on a religious subject, because I think there's a lot to, to dig into here. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll read uh, uh, a little passage here. Even when the theme is not expressly such, the ideal plot film should not pass over the religious element. Indeed, it has been noted that even films morally above reproach can yet be spiritually harmful if they offer the spectator a world in which no sign is given of God or of men who believe in and worship him, a world in which people live as though God did not exist. A brief moment in a film can sometimes be sufficient, a word on God, a thought directed towards him, a sigh of confidence in him, an appeal for divine help. The great majority of people believe in God, and in their lives, religious feeling plays a considerable part. Nothing then is more natural and more suitable than for due account to be taken of this in films. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, that's interesting observation. You know, we hear people talk about this, like just, just the portrayal of, say, Catholic priests in films, even films that are not about religion, or, or just the lack of, you know, pr you know, positive portrayal of religious people, etc. But here he's ta just talking about the, the total absence of the religious element in life, that in films that are purporting to portray life as it is, um, or society as it is, uh, still um, religion uh, or a little casual expressions of religion uh, tend to be tend to be absent. Uh, so I think that's an interesting point and something that we don't think about too much in at least in, we think of it in terms of representation or whatever. But I don't know if we think of it as much in terms of kind of the the uh, the worldview that it subtly inculcates in in the viewer who, you know, uh, whose whose views of how the world is, is formed by a lot of film watching. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting to think about, um, you know, both in Europe and in the USA in this period, you know, in the US, we're, we're under the production code, you know, in Europe, there are various um, streams of filmmaking happening. What they kind of have in common and what may seem strange to us from our vantage point is that that was a period, as he, you know, is, is alluding to in the document that was already being, it was already very secular in in a number of ways. Um, and <clears throat> in American cinema, I think it's, I, f I still find it striking. Actually, it, I find it striking more and more, uh, when I watch, uh, American films from the, th you know, the thirties, um, and the forties and fifties, uh, you see that the secularism is just kind of assumed. Um, there may be, you know, nods to God here and there as he kind of mentions, but on the whole, the, you know, you're seeing all lots of different, kinds of stories and, and characters who really are living and acting as though God doesn't really matter. Um, I think of how, you know, marriage and divorce is handled in Hollywood, you know, movies of this time. It's, it's such a kind of like, it's such a constant kind of back and forth of, of characters, you know, getting divorces or getting, you know, quick marriages. Um, just right, the, even the awful truth in which the marriage triumphs, like doesn't really have any kind of, sense of like the Gravity. sacredness of the vow yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And I mean, and, and you know, you can make the argument, well, that's just, you know, comedy kind of exaggerating something, for, you know, for, it to, for its effect. But, um, I think, I think you see it across the board piety, you know, religious piety, uh, is, is something that's kind of reserved for specifically religious topics. Um, I, I think many of our listeners will be maybe most of our listeners will be f familiar with kind of the handful of titles from classic Hollywood that always come up. Song of Bernadette, Keys of the Kingdom, Come to the Stable, uh, Ben-Hur. You know, it's kind of like the same, I would say, like maybe dozen, if that even, uh, films that are kind of referenced as high watermarks for Hollywood religiosity. I think one reason why they're, it's kind of always the same ones being brought up is because there weren't actually that, one, there weren't, that many religious films to speak of. Um, but then also too, you know, they stand out because, you know, the virtue of piety and, and related aspects 
uh, are kind of, um, they're not lacking from all the other films, but uh, it's just that, you know, they really, th- 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 you can see that there is kind of an exception here. And I think part of that is to do, even with the, the treatment of religion under the production code in general, you know, there's this kind of sense of uh, sometimes you get very specific, you know, Catholic or Protestant characters where the film is uh, goes into the kind of the specifics of that. But often there's a more just general kind of veneer of religiosity um, that is supposed to sort of, it's sort of this American civil Christianism, Christianity that, you know, everyone kind of assumes. So um, I think he's responding to that aspect. I think in Europe there was, uh, I, I don't have so many European examples offhand, but I think you can kind of see that too. And a lot of the writers um, who are writing about religion and cinema from the, from the forties and the fifties, you know, you can sort of see there's this like alternative canon of uh, French and Italian films that are on specifically religious subjects. They might be about saints. Uh, but there's also this kind of sense in, in a lot of these writings that these are films that are seen by the mainstream French and Italian film industries as kind of outside the norm or kind of outside the mainstream, uh, such that, you know, the the biggest names, the biggest directors are not the ones who are taking on these projects. Um and so I don't know. I, I mean, there's not really much more, I guess, to be said about that. But just that the what we if we think that <clears throat> what we're kind of dealing with today, you know, when we filmmakers are, are kind of struggling with the same uh, uh, lack of religiosity, it's you know, I guess I guess maybe my point is that um, we can't really go back to a previous era of film history to kind of recover that because we've never really had a grounding. Orson Welles was kind of famous for. Uh, saying there are two things you can't depict on f- film, which uh, first is sex and the second thing is prayer. Oh, uh, interesting. Now, I don't know when he said that. I don't know if that was in the 30s or the 40s or, or later in life. Um, yeah, I've not heard but, that. But it's an interesting, you know, there's a lot of truth to it uh, in in the regards to, again, that aspect of like, what is the camera? What is the, what is the ph- photographic medium capturing? Uh, a prayer is a is a spiritual act. Yes, there's the physical... Uh, elements that go there are the signs of prayer but can a photograph really actually yeah. properly convey the essence of of a prayerful act um you know to to a viewer uh is a is a really interesting question i mean orson wells in his i haven't seen a lot of his movies but in his macbeth he actually adds a prayer to saint michael anachronistically mm-hmm. because obviously it's like a 19th century late 19th century creation um but uh you know, that wasn't in the original play, but he he put that in there, which is kind of cool. Um, Wow. Didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting topic. And I think, I think a lot of, a lot of the kind of requests actually that Pius makes of people in the second part of this exhortation, uh, the requests he makes of filmmakers are as often it's like, it's not like necessarily make movies about X, but it's like let your movies include X, mm. like as a matter of course, like let your movies include uh, positive portrays, portrayals of family life, for instance, he talks about. But it's it's not he's not saying that every you know these movies have to be didactic statements about family life or about religious subjects or whatever. Um, he is he is. I mean, he is, yes, asking that kind of like an ideal be portrayed in some way, but um, it can be, it doesn't have to be like the central aspect of the, the movie necessarily mm-hmm. to have power. And I think that's something that he, something that he recognizes. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's yeah. a great point. And, you know, he doesn't bring up the sacraments, but we've talked in the past on, on this podcast about um, how rare it is to see even in saint movies, uh, maybe even most especially in saint movies, uh, things like receiving the Eucharist, you know, moments like that, moments of the sacraments that really in the ordinary life, including the ordinary life of any saint, that's that's the fabric. That's part of the, just the, the daily fabric. of, yeah. uh, And it's missing, um, you know, from all sorts of stories where that would be part of the background. Right. But just to take like a counterexample too, um, Everybody who's seen, you know, a lot, a bunch of movies from, you know, over, over the, you know, the variety of decades of, of Hollywood has seen at least a few scenes where somebody's in a church and they genuflect. Mm. And that's, you know, like you, you have that in, I believe in like Schindler's List, for example, towards the end of the movie, he goes, 
he, he goes to uh, see his wife who's, who's attending mass and, and he genuflects. And so, you know, there's there's things like that. And, and I think that people know about genuflection who aren't Catholic because they've seen it in movies or at least at one time they did, you know. Mm. Um, and so I, there are little things like, you don't, yeah, sure, you don't have to be able to portray the invisible reality of prayer, but there are these gestures and kind of little moments that you can that you can portray that will at least sort of familiarize people with kind of like the vocabulary of of prayer or just that fact that it exists or that gestures of reverence are done, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's an example that occurred to me is that you don't see as much, um, you know, Eucharistic adoration or whatever, but you do see those little things. You see characters going to mass, you see genuflections, even in, in non-religious films from time to time. And, it's something that has value if it's not being like immediately, you know, uh, sort of like undercut by like the characters just then immediately having some like worldly or like irreverent conversation, like sitting there in the pew, which, you know, mm-hmm. happens often enough, obviously. But mm-hmm. um, and the conf- and we all know the confessional is, you know, portrayed in, in films right. uh, fairly often. Um, because it's it's one of those areas where you can actually advance the plot because <laughs> it's di- it's a dialogue. <laughs> uh-huh, right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So um, to continue on his comments, he says, on the other hand, we must recognize that not every religious action or occurrence can be transferred to the screen because either a scenic representation of it is intrinsically impossible or piety and reverence are opposed to it. We were just talking about that, so we don't need to hammer on that. But I wonder if you can think of an example of the last aspect, piety and reverence are opposed to a particular religious action being being portrayed. You could probably make an argument for aspects of filming the liturgy, you know, or, or really, I think it would be more with regards to like how you would film it. You know, would you film consecration of the host, like with a fisheye lens, like in someone's face, in a priest's face, like from a, from a vantage point that no person would ever Mm. actually see it or that, you know, certainly no one who isn't a priest wouldn't, would see it, you know, is it appropriate to sort of take vantage points that aren't really realistic from a human point of view. I mean, like maybe attempting to like film the beatific vision or something would like fall into that, you know? Well, you know, this comes up from time to time, you know, every so often some filmmaker in Hollywood will be attached to a project that wants to, you know, to make a film version of paradise lost or something. And it's, you know, uh, the kind of thing where that could be a very creative and interesting project or yeah, it could be a complete like, misfire you know because of what or Dante's you, you know the divine comedy or something yeah or or something from you know book of revelation or or um actually i'll say one more thing i do think on the prayer question i think this is a again this is an area where i i i think wells orson wells was onto something with that aspect of okay the the heart the real essence of the of the act is you know kind of it remains private like it's between the uh you know the prayer and god um there's something that a viewer is just not going to receive from that so the question of how to portray that there's ways to portray prayer to, or to portray that relationship um but it's going to have to be through different gestures as you were kind of saying earlier different i don't know like not that it's impossible like seeing a character pray on screen or to act praying like that's you know that's legitimate but there's a reason i, I guess that we haven't quite solved that problem that i think a lot of viewers into it when they see like an overly sanctimonious or sentimentalized depiction of prayer. Um, and it's usually maybe like a depiction of verbal prayer, uh, or if it's a depiction of, of nonverbal prayer, then it's, you know, some other element in the, in the arrangement, in the mise-en-scene of the, of the film, the lighting or the sound or something, something, or the music is, is meant to like heighten and create the effect that's, that's missing from purely seeing. I'd be really curious to see what would happen if we were just more comfortable with just kind of sitting in that real moment and watching somebody pray with the discomfort of, of not really knowing exactly what's yeah. going on, you know? Right. Um, okay. Well, I mean, that directly touches on this next paragraph. Moreover, religious topics often present particular difficulties to authors and actors among which perhaps the chief is how to avoid all trace of artificiality and affectation, every impression of a lesson learnt mechanically, since true religious feeling is essentially the opposite of external show and does not easily allow itself to be declaimed. 
Religious interpretation, even when it is carried out with a right intention, rarely receives the stamp of an experience truly lived and as a result capable of being shared with the spectator. So uh, I think that last sentence is another extremely quotable part of this in mm -hmm. Google. I think that should I think that sentence should like be be like a common reference point mm -hmm. for the discussion of religious cinema, you know, that should be well known and that should be shared and quoted, you know, alongside, you know, uh, Tolkien's thoughts on like allegory or all the like the commonly shared quotes out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what, um, even just hearing that again, it makes me think about, okay, well, what, you know, in moments in cinema, when you've had what you'd, you know, would be a powerful kind of spiritual experience or a powerful experience of seeing a depiction of spirituality, I'm thinking about, you know, that has to involve an epiphany on the part of the viewer. You know, it's not enough to simply show someone having an epiphany. You know, there has to be some element that the viewer, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, about the viewer is kind of creating the event, is, is participating in this creative act with you. There has to be some, like the 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 context of the epiphany or, or the miracle or whatever it is happening that is fundamentally like uncapturable by photography. Some, something, uh, of an epiphany has to be happening for the viewer to really make that register. And I'm wondering what that would be, you know, whether it's just creating that space for contemplation within the form of the film for the viewer to kind of wander a bit, or whether it's, um, you know, a more specifically kind of dramatic or a uh, plot related kind of development that I mean, that we, we look, we know this is possible because it's been done in poetry. It's become, been done in sacred art. It's been done in music. Like we know this is possible. There's no reason it shouldn't be possible in film. Like, like one example that springs to mind actually is uh, of gods and men. Uh, the film about the Algerian uh, martyrs um, in uh, the late in the 1990s. Uh, there's a scene. Have you seen it, Thomas? Have we talked about no. it? Or? Okay. No. Well, there's a scene uh, where the, the monks, the, the uh, Carthusian monks, they, uh, they're basically having the, what they what they think is they're going to be their last meal, and someone puts on Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake to listen to, and we just kind of watch them listening for several minutes to to the climax of the ballet, and it's it's quite striking. You know, it's it's kind of the most significant moment in the film, but all we're doing is watching these men just listening to the music, and there's a you know prayerful aspect to it where you can you know for sure these guys are preparing you know for the end um mm -hmm. but we're not privy to the content of that we're simply with them in that but in that interplay the beauty of the music and the way that's kind of bound the way that's refracting off of the dramatic scenario that we've been given and, and then the, the silence kind of the dramatic nature of mm -hmm. the silence of the the men that we're seeing that they're not saying anything um creates this kind of rich soil for us to kind of wander and just kind of come to, you know, a kind of some kind of understanding of what they're going through. Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting because, I mean, we were talking earlier about, I was talking earlier about with regard to um, like virtual action and the, the viewer who's passive, like wanting to like sort of identify himself with the actions and the, the people he's seeing on, on screen um, but in this case, like it's the viewer who's being passive and he's like watching other people be sort of passive or contemplative, however you mm -hmm. want to put it. And mm -hmm. so there's like this double like active passivity going on where the viewer has to kind of like he can't just identify himself with like a specific action. He actually has to like go and contemplate and be in this more like free wandering zone himself in order to like identify with what the characters are doing. And so maybe that requires like more resources on the part of the viewer, but it can also like awaken him to something that he might otherwise not be aware of. Yeah. I think that, I think that's right. It's kind of an invitation to a deeper experience of leisure. You know, it's, it's sort of almost like, uh, you know, we know when we're watching a film, it really the, the film is leading us to where it thinks we should go. Um, and often that's very busy. It's very active. But how that's why it's all the more striking when a filmmaker makes the countercultural, I would say, decision to to stop the busyness and to really have a moment of rest. And that that really invites us into that moment of of leisurely contemplation. Um, you know, it's quite it's quite unique when that happens. Right.
And now Pius says that even when religious interpretation is carried out with the right intention, it rarely receives the stamp of a, an experience truly lived and as a result capable of being shared with the spectator. And, you know, they say that you can't um, give what you, you don't have. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there's that problem, right? Um, but, uh, and, and that's, you know, that's why Catholic artists have to have like a real spiritual life, obviously. But yeah. um, also... Well, I, was just, I was just gonna say, like, yeah. in, in line of that, it makes me think of, you know, again, the sort of classic Hollywood, you know, model that, that a lot of people like to mock when they talk about um, holy moments or whatever. And I, I think Song mm-hmm. of Bernadette's kind of like foremost in people's minds when this happens where the, you know, it's the choir, you know, the soft lighting and the eyes looking out. It's kind of the, almost the Spielberg, you know, Spielberg kind of took this, <laughs> this posture of the human, of the human soul in a way and, and did his own thing with it. But it's that, that it's that experience, the expression of awe and, and then the music, but the music in particular is what always gets me. It's, it's this very insistently saying this is, but you know, this is what's happening. Um, and then what's interesting is that gets fed into our perception like of, you know, people always talk about when they have experiences in prayer, uh, you know, it wasn't like the movies. It wasn't like this thing, even if nobody, um, consciously expects it to be like that. There's still this expectation of a certain kind of dramatic nature to it. And right. I, I guess what I'm getting at is the way that the film film has fed our perception and expectation of what the real thing right. is, uh, is supposed to be like. But I mean, the other, and the other aspect of what he says here that um, being capable of being shared with the spectator is like you, the, the filmmaker may, or the actor may have had such an experience, but they may be too, like they may not going back to like, allowing for freedom like they may not trust the viewer so they may be too heavy-handed or they may you know they may like squash it in the way that you know parents can can sort of like over explain or over prompt their children in their own prayer and spirit young children like their own spiritual experiences rather than like trusting that like the holy spirit is working in the small child even without like a lot of like theoretical understanding um Mm -hmm. i think a similar thing can happen for religious art, obviously. I think um, just one last note on this that it ties in. Andre, Andre Bazin um, wrote a great um, essay in the early 1950s about uh, a film that was about the life of St. Maria Goretti. And the film's called, it's an Italian film called Heaven Over the Marshes is the, is the English title. Mm-hmm. And um, he wrote an essay about, that was praising the film for, um, for not falling into these kind of pie, formally pious ways of expressing the sanctity of St. Maria Goretti that that film is, I think I haven't seen it, but my understanding is that it's, it's somewhat in the neorealist tradition and that it's, it's taking a very kind of uh, just day to day view. Um, but Bazin was the point he was trying to draw out uh, was that, uh, you know, obviously in the life of a saint, um, you know, who's still with us on earth, <laughs> uh, the ordin- it's still ordinary, you know, life is still ordinary uh, and to the, the eyes of the viewer who, you know, things will still seem ordinary. That's, I think that's a really important insight for, for filmmakers who want to adapt, um, you know, pious subjects and especially the lives of the saints, that how that looks in action in the moment isn't, you know, with the benefit of hindsight. Like if we really want to get into that moment we're, we we need to see that, uh, see that life unfold the way that we would see any life unfold in terms of its kind of ordinary and then sometimes extraordinary aspects. Right. So let's move on to films and representation of evil, another interesting uh, subject. So I'll just read from him a bit here. It is one thing to know evil and seek from philosophy and religion its explanation and cure, quite another to make it an object of a spectacle and amusement. Yet for many there is an irresistible fascination in giving artistic shape to wrongdoing, in describing its power and its growth, its open and hidden paths, and the conflicts it generates or by means of which it advances. One might say that for, the ba- for a basis of story and picture, many know not where to look for artistic inspiration and dramatic interest, except in, in the realm of evil, even if only as background for good, as shadow from which light may reflect more clearly. Now then, can the ideal film take such matter for its theme? The greatest poets and writers of all times and of all peoples have grappled with this hard and thorny theme and will continue to do so in the future. 
To such question, a negative answer is natural, wherever perversity is, and evil are presented for their own sakes. If the wrongdoing represented is at least in fact approved, if it is described in stimulating, insidious, or corrupting ways, if it is shown to those who are not capable of controlling and resisting it. But when none of these causes for exclusion are present, when the struggle with evil and even its temporary victory serves in relation to the whole, to a deeper understanding of life and its proper ordering, of self-control, of enlightenment and strengthening of judgment and action, then such matter can be chosen and inserted as a part of the whole action of the film. The same criterion applies here that must rule any like artistic medium, novel, drama, tragedy, every literary work. Um, and if I can say, to me, the most significant part of this is the last part um, from from the point of uh, from the point of a historical development of the church's position on on cinema that the same criterion applies here that must rule any like artistic medium um, and so here we get film being treated as not only a mass entertainment medium um, obviously there is a concern about showing it to people who are not able to understand it um, but but that that basically film has the same privileges in depicting evil uh, as as other mediums, according, of course, according to the nature of photography and what's what's permissible there. But but basically, in terms of like the literary aspect of it, it's just as it's just as able to be nuanced and complex and challenging as uh, any other uh, the other medium of art, which I think is a very important thing for for uh, this period in film history. I mean, part of the complexity is that like, I think there's a legitimate enjoyment of the art of somebody portraying a villain well, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we, we can enjoy the kind of like the, the let's pretend of it all, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a sense. But I think that, I think again, like I, I mentioned this before, the more that you get into like really gritty, dark, evil stuff, like the less sort of excusable it is to just remain on that kind of like we're having fun playing dress up mm -hmm. kind of level. You know, I think there's like a real debasement that happens. I mean, um, you know, to take an example, like we've we've talked about like horror films, you know, occult horror films where there's like this uh, this increasing like sort of interest on just like a on in kind of like a matter of fact way mm -hmm. uh, by filmmakers in portraying like the occult in like a lot of detail and a lot of like disturbing ways. Um, but it's done just for like, I don't know, the spectacle of it or something. And, and it's, it's not, you know, you're invoking like very serious things without like a, a, a sufficiently serious purpose to it. The further you go away from like sort of must mustache twirling, like Captain Hook type stuff, and the more you go into like really serious, heavy stuff the more dangerous it becomes to sort of portray that in a kind of a self-indulgent way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we can, we can all point to examples of, of films we've seen where I think you can clearly tell that's what's happening. Like the, that, the, the, the proper framework has been lost or was never there to begin with. Yeah. Um, what I'm kind of wondering is about those films that are kind of conflicted. They're kind of, you know, like seeing somebody tempted, like they're kind of caught between those impulses and it's hard to sort of see where they kind of land. And just to give us like some contrast under the old production code, you know, it was a very common sort of uh, decision to impose upon a tragic work, uh, either like a, a made up happy ending, like if they're adapting like a tragic novel it was quite common that uh, the the production code would, um, you know, or maybe even if, if it can't be blamed on the, there, there are cases where the production code was kind of the impetus, but it could also be producers who just don't, they, you know, they don't want people to be sad or whatever. But there's this, there's this history of the Hollywood ending, you know, of imposing kind of a, a, a falsely happy, sentimentalized ending on deeply tragic material. Um, yeah. But there's the, also a history of imposing like a, a, a dark like crime doesn't pay ending right. on the story of a criminal. Yeah. And, and so, and, and that, that's a good, that's, that's kind of where I'm going with, um, I think, I think one of the justified reactions to the production code that we see after it fell is, um, you know, is against that kind of imposition, um, yeah. where people are looking at reality and they're saying, 
crim, you know, crime does seem to pay like <laughs> crime. Right. Nobody's getting their comeuppance in this life. Uh, yeah. but the, the policy was that films always have to show the bad guys getting their comeuppance in this life. And so right. an aspect of reality is being ignored. And this is an area where I think, you know, Catholic artists in particular have, have so much to, to offer, you know, with right. capturing the actual reality of suffering. Um, and yeah, that, because Pius that, does say, nevertheless, that it, we should be guided, the viewer should be guided by someone as though by someone who knows more than him. So it's not mm -hmm. that you can just, again, you can't just like leave it at, well, I guess crime does pay and like there's no justice exactly. in this world, you know, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's mean. a balance like, you know, because, yeah, it could easily and, and that's where, you know, much American cinema has gone since the production code is into this nihilistic kind of, you know, right. no, there's no nothing matters, you know, kind of thing. Um, yeah. I think of a film like uh, There Will Be Blood, which I'm I'm not a fan of this film for all sorts of reasons. Um, but I think it's an example of a, of a film that is kind of towing this line. It's hard, you know, maybe somewhat um, facetiously where it's obviously very, very much about a very wicked man and it's in the, the star of the film who's one of the world's greatest actors is, you know, putting all of his craft into portraying the, every nuance of a very, very wicked black hearted man. Um, and you know, that's the spectacle is this monster. But then of course, thankfully like the film, is, you know, is tragic. Like it shows his downfall. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't really like, kind of it's not really interested in, in that aspect you know it's mm. it's it, to me it's like very just interested in reveling in this kind of you know performance of wickedness right um but you could you know on paper it's like well yeah obviously he's a tragic figure if that's one of those cases where i'm like you know we could kind of people can go back and forth on it but um mm -hmm. i would i would call it an unsatisfying depiction of evil you know for right for there's something missing some texture some something missing from its its uh its understanding of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I want to quote the next bit and he's talking about the poetic and dramatic description of evil in scripture. <clears throat> he says their wrongdoing and guilt are not masked by deceitful veils, but told as they really happened. Nay, even that part of a world stained by guilt is enveloped in an aura of uprightness and purity produced by an author who, while faithful to history, does not exalt or justify, but clearly urges the condemnation of wickedness. In such wise, the crude truth does not arouse disordered passions or impulses, at least in mature persons. Um, on the contrary, the serious reader becomes more reflective, more clear-sighted. His mind turning inwards is led to say, take heed lest you too be led into temptation. If you stand, take heed lest you fall. Um, and again, it's like, how often does that really happen in these in these movies where... Um, it's just kind of like a crime thriller or a heist movie or whatever. And you don't really get any kind of, you don't feel sobered at the end. You just feel like you were entertained, but like the matter of the entertainment again was like just evil being done basically. Yes. There's a downfall. You see the bad consequences, but you feel like maybe it's fatalistic or it's nihilistic and it doesn't really matter either way. Uh, kind of thing. It's like, yes, in the world, this is what happens when you do evil things, you know, you get your comeuppance, but like it, it it's, it's more of like a, maybe a, you might call it like it's a mechanistic or it's like a psychological consequence without like a true moral weight or like a true like moral challenge to the viewer, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's getting at it. I think also part of it is, is that there, there's a formal, there's a real formal challenge uh, in how you realize the film where to, to have a viewer have that kind of personal, you know, reflection, um, you know, you could either do that didactically, which I think, you know, we don't want, which would, you know, be somebody kind of like breaking the fourth wall or something almost, almost as bad as that. Um, to be clear, breaking the fourth wall is not bad per se, <laughs> but often it, if it's used in a didactic sense that can, that can go really badly. Um, yeah. To, to address the, the viewer, you know, you know, personally in a way, or there has to be a character who the viewer can identify with, who's going through that journey, him or herself, uh, which then allows a door for the, the viewer to kind of go on that journey. I think it's just, it's really hard to do that in a two hour movie, you know, because mm -hmm. you can only have so many characters, you can only have so many plot threads that are, that, that, you know, you have enough time to kind of 
flesh out at that level. When I think of a film that does this really well, uh, what comes to mind is the the film A Brighter Summer Day by Edward Yang, um, mm-hmm. which uh, without going into spoilers, you know, one is four you know four hours long and it shows an entire nest a whole community really a family and then all, and the community around this family and it's all about uh, and and we go deep into all these various relationships social relationships family relationships that culminate in um you know a a, a crime being committed um and I find that film, you know, that film to me has that kind of cautionary aspect to it because you can see the chain of relationships and how if any different other character, if some character at some point had stepped in to do something differently in the life of, of one person, maybe they wouldn't have done what they did, you know, mm-hmm. and, and but but it takes all four of those hours and all this kind of accumulated weight of of dynamics to really get that like at a deep level so i think part of it might be like it takes time you know to kind of let it sink that's also like a a singularly like non-exploitative movie like it's extremely tasteful and it's depiction Mm -hmm. of like everything uh and it's not like it's really not like a goodfellas (laughs) i'm not even like attacking goodfellas but i just mean like people enjoy Goodfellas is a really fun movie, you yes. know, like, yes, yeah. the, like the char- it's like I remember like despising the characters in it as I was watching. But like there is like a fun to it. You're cheering that, for them kind of. What's that? You're kind of cheering for them. Like, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's like hanging out with the guys. And, you know, there's a little of that in maybe in uh, Brighter Summer Day. But for the most part, it's it's very like it reads much more like a serious novel or something than like it, it has a very removed um, objective. I would say contemplative, humanist, yes. compassionate yes. eye. Like there's something about it. It's, it's objective and it's compassionate. Whereas Goodfellas is very obviously caught up in the passion of of the subject. It's it's subjective. And, it, and I mean, it, that is a film being told from memory in a way that A Brighter Summer Day, I don't yeah. think is to the same degree. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I'm not, you know, attacking Goodfellas. I've only seen it once. And it was a long time ago. So I don't remember. I think it's a great long. comparison, like to show, yeah. you know, the, the, the perils that, that come along with it. So. One thing that also comes to mind um, is how, especially if you're, you know, you're a cinephile, you're, you're consuming a lot of films. Um, and if you're consuming a lot of like art house films, um, films that, or you can say like film festival films, films that don't necessarily get like a proper release or they're not, they're not directed towards the mainstream audience. Um, I've noticed over time, there's a real tendency um, because a lot of films that are part of the festival kind of market scene. Uh, there's a certain there's a certain cli- there's certain cliches that come along with that, and one of them is obviously the transgressive or transgression as kind of a as a distinctive feature. You know, um, if you're consuming a lot of these films that you know, in, in the one hand, there's value to them and that they're maybe going into real aspects of of the darkness of human nature that you know deserves a real serious treatment. The downside is, you know, if you're kind of repeating experiences with these kinds of films, it can also start to change your perception of like what what is and isn't real or like how common certain things happening in these films are are are, are or are not. Um, and it's just something I, I do think. I mean, obviously, we're a media saturated culture, so there's all sorts of areas in which the you know me- media in general is changing our perception on things. But that's just one one area where as I get older, I really sort of see the, the influences of, of, um, you know, life is not necessarily as reflective of, of that repeated kind of buffet of, you know, um, experiences would suggest. And it also makes me Mm -hmm. think about in a previous era in a less mediated era, um, you know, the only, we're talking about depictions of human sin, like, you know, really that that was something that was much more kind of, uh, under wraps, like if you're a priest, you would be very well acquainted with it because you're hearing confessions. Mm-hmm. But, you know, outside of that, it's not something that, like, I, it makes me wonder about previous ages and how obviously people, people have always been very aware of the brokenness and fallenness of their, of their neighbor. Yeah. But you wouldn't know, like, necessarily their deepest, darkest secrets or desires. And there's something about right. a lot of these films that are about deepest, darkest secrets and yeah. desires. And I think that repeated over time is like, you know, changing our perception of maybe, mm. yeah, you know, what that means really. 
so Pius concludes, therefore, the ideal film should flee from any form of apology, much less of glorification of evil, and should show its condemnation through the entire course of the film and not merely at the end. Frequently, it would come too late, i.e. after the spectator is already beguiled and entrapped by evil promptings. I think that uh, definitely you see that in movies. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just there's clearly there there are, are artful ways of of situating somebody in the in a proper moral point of view without hammering it home, and and yeah. then that and then if that's done properly, this kind of solves the problem that the the sort of production code solution we were talking about earlier of like oh you know the hammer of justice has to come down at the end, right? And, and that's always kind of unreal, often or always very uh, we'll say often that's most often unrealistic <laughs> yeah um you know so this is a again this is a a nuanced uh, way of of really approaching it right i mean i think of the the movie um ace in the hole and you know that's a very dark cynical movie and i i you know I would have to interrogate like my own enjoyment of <laughs> its depiction of evil i guess but like uh, because of the, you know, because of the code, I believe they had to like make the the guy, the anti-hero guy, die at the end. Mm. And um, I thought that the movie would have been more sort of devastating a way if, in a way if he hadn't. Um, mm -hmm. It's about a, a corrupt journalist, and it's very cynical about the media in general. And I I think it would have been like perhaps like a more strong social critique if like he hadn't died at the end and if he had like sort of gotten away with it right mm -hmm. um i think i think in that case like the guy getting away with it would like leave you more perhaps more like outraged against evil at the end you know than than you would yeah. have been i just i just wonder what they could have done if they hadn't had to do that and hadn't had to do that ending i think it would be potentially be more interesting yeah. um so um, the next section, the third section on the ideal film is the ideal film seen and considered in relation to the community. And I don't think we have a lot to say about this section um, other than sort of in general. I don't think we're going to get into the details of this one. But basically, he goes through some basically some social functions that he thinks it would be good for films to serve. And these have to do with sort of upholding the dignity of different social institutions, the family, the state, uh, the church. He expresses concerns that films may have helped to spread an attitude of skepticism and irony about the goodness of the institution of the family, quote, by exalting its erroneous conditions and especially casting em empty and frivolous disdain on this dignity of spouses and parents. I mean, you hear people talk about this with sitcoms, you know, all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is a pretty commonplace observation. I don't think that we need to dwell on it. Um, but he basically says that um, that motion pictures should consider it as their task to portray and spread a, a concept of the family that is that is correct and noble. Um, and he says, quote, all that can be gotten without many words, but with fit pictures and by developing attractive situations. Um, so it, again, it doesn't have to be this heavy handed didactic thing. So again, with the state, do you have anything to say or can I, can I move on? Uh, just a, not nothing except that it, while I'm looking at the quote and the, the whole quote of, I know you're not going to read the whole thing of how he describes yeah. like, you know, the depiction of, of a, of a father and husband who's, you know, struggle, you know, manful, but also struggling to, to fulfill his, you know, his state in life and of a, of a woman, of a wife and mother who finds her happiness in the home. Um, but is also, you know, dealing with her own crosses. And it, it what came to mind was actually the tree of life <laughs> mm -hmm. as a, as a great example of a film that is eminently realistic right. in all sorts of ways, but, but also in that it really captures, you know, the faults and the virtues of, I, I think I think that's a great example, actually, that, that of this kind of thing, because because what I was thinking about was as a you know what what films are there that really depict family life kind of in its yeah. glory and in its suffering in a in a proper way, you know. And right. I can't think of too many offhand that really leap yeah. to the. Yeah, this is not a film that like trivializes or like sneers at the faults of fathers or you yeah. know something like that. It's all handled like with a real seriousness. So he talks about the state in similar ways. He says it's a national it's a natural institution. We have to respect it, but because often, you know, there's there's things that cause people to have, you know, repugnance towards the state, then it's important for films to strengthen quote, strengthen the true bases of social life 
And he says the film producer can give important help in this matter too, though it is not his first and most important task. Still, with that effectiveness peculiar to it, his activity can usefully enter to block divisive tendencies, to remind men of whatever good has been neglected, lead them to esteem correctly what has been falsely valued um, with regard to state institutions and activities. Okay, the church, he says something similar. He says, the church, quote, which embraces a whole spiritual and supernatural world, completely escapes any artistic portrayal, since it transcends the very possibilities of human instruments of expression, yet a basic awareness of her presence will assure for her that respect and reverence which, which she deserves. And he also says that whenever history or the plot or realism make it necessary to pre present the failures of churchmen, there should be a clear distinction between the institution and the person. So I mean, that all makes basic common sense. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, again, here he says uh, a basic awareness of her presence. So it's not so much about you have to make this movie and the lesson is how great the church is. I mean, I'm sure he wants some some such movies to to exist, but like. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's also about just like the atmosphere mm -hmm. in which sort of these plots take place. Um, so yeah. that's pretty much it for, uh, the ideal film, this apostolic exhortation. Any, any final words on that, Nathan? Um, just that I was struck by his closing, you know, a paragraph about where he says, uh, you know, basically in closing, uh, we'll reveal our, our, you know, speaking with a pontifical voice, our deepest feelings, um, and it's just interesting to see him reflect on kind of, this is very kind of compassionate elegy for, you know, the, just the, the men and women and children going to see the movies, this idea that, you know, he's saying to the, you, the filmmaker, you know, you have these, these are the people you're, you're reaching like to have this kind of compassion for, they're looking for God, you know, and you have the means to give them what he says is a, a ray of God, you know, through the true, the good and the beautiful. Um, and I just find that, yeah, I find that convicting. I find that, that powerful. And, and, um, how often do we, do we, by, by we, I mean, film, filmmakers, like how often do we really think of it in those terms? Um, you know, that we're, we're passing along a ray, a ray of God mm. to others. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, um, that's, that's the bulk of our discussion here, but I do want to touch on Miranda Prorsus, his encyclical on, Motion Pictures, Radio, and Television. This came out two years after the ideal film, September 8th, 1957. And this is um, this is in a more stern tone, much like um, Vigilante Cura, which was 20 years before. One thing I do want to mention that pertains to uh, our episode on Pius XI's Vigilante Cura, we talked a lot about his statement that the end of art was like the moral... The moral edification of of man, basically, um, and uh, in in this encyclical, Pius the Twelfth says quotes himself on a pre in a previous address, saying, "It is true that an explicitly moral or religious function is not demanded of art as art." And I just we don't have to you know dwell on that, but I think that sort of confirms what we were talking about in the first episode of this series. Uh, about, you know, yes, you can talk about the end, end of art being, art being sort of the moral uplifting of man. However, like that is not necessarily the proximate end of a given work of art. That is part of the fact that art exists in this context of human life. But that has more to do with like the final end of all human activities um, than necessarily the, the immediate sort of end of art, qua art at any in any given uh, particular work. Like I said, we're not gonna we're not gonna go too deep into this because a lot of this isn't even about film. Um, a couple of a couple of remarks he makes. Uh, he says that private and voluntary industry censorship is not enough. Public authority must be involved. And he had said that in the ideal film too, actually. Um, he says that the minds of spectators need to be trained to a mature self-restraint and judgment regarding what they see on screen. And he says, quote, this, however, should not provide an excuse for attending shows which are contrary to right morals. So you don't, you know, see every, you know, see all these new bad movies uh, just because you want to train yourself to uh, mature self-restraint and judgment. It's kind of like the cultural engagement model or cultural and critique model that Joshua Gibbs critiques in his uh, his book Love Love What Last, where you sort of watch films like just to criticize them or something like that. 
And uh, finally, on TV and radio, uh, we're going to focus mostly on his comments on films, but it is worth mentioning his his comments that TV and radio penetrate into the domestic circle, so they must be especially careful to be age appropriate because they are sort of, you know, guests in your home, essentially. Um, it's surprising that he's very like optimistic about TV as a medium, as long as the content is good and sort of like religiously uplifting and stuff. He, he doesn't actually mention the concern about like excessive use of TV or its effect on kind of the atmosphere of the home. If like the TV is, is on all the time and things like that. I think, I think it's probably just too early, uh, for that in the history of TV, uh, for that even to be sort of like realized as a, as a potential, uh, problem. Mm -hmm. But the main aspect of film that I want to touch on is that in this encyclical, a lot of it is just re basically reiterating what uh, Pius XI said in Vigilante Cura. But Pius XII goes into more detail about particular occupations related to film. So, for example, he talks about the obligations of directors and producers. Um, he talks about actors in particular. He talks about film critics. So I want to focus on a couple of those subsections, if not all of them. And firstly... Um, the main thing that I'm interested in is this very short section on film criticism. So I'll just read the whole quote. He says, Catholic film critics can have much influence. They ought to set the moral issue of the plot in its proper light, defending those judgments which will act as a safeguard against falling into so-called relative morality or the overthrow of that right order in which the lesser issues yield place to the most important, to the more important. Quite wrong, therefore, is the action of writers in daily papers and in reviews claiming to be Catholic if, when dealing with shows of this kind, they do not instruct their readers concerning the moral position to be adopted. Uh, so that's actually something we've talked about a lot on this podcast and the approach that we take, take to the moral aspect of films. Um, and it's a pet peeve of mine when I see Catholic uh, outlets doing film reviews where they kind of like leave out major problems in moral content as though like we can just sort of take it for granted that the that the reader is you know properly on guard or is going to know what's what's coming at him when he watches a film things like that i think i think that at least like a word of warning in those instances is is warranted now you know um <laughs> Pius may not even have that a word of warning in mind so much as just like outright condemnation, right? Uh, when it comes to films, he, he, he might he might take a much more conservative position about like, well, just don't watch the movie. Don't just give a warning, but actually tell people to not see it. But at the very least, a word of warning is 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 warranted, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say about that, because we've talked about this quite a lot in our you know Vatican film list discussion, etc. But um, I think it's worth noting we do have like actual teaching from the magisterium on the moral obligation of, of Catholic film critics. Yeah, this is an area that I, I I would like to see the church revisit to some degree just to give maybe more clarification with regards to the way that information nowadays is there's much more access to information about a given film. Like we have hmm. the IMDB, we have various content guides, you know, like plugged in and whatnot that that go into um, you know, objectionable content. Not that this is only about objectionable content, you know, cause it's about the whole de dealing with, you know, more complex moral problems as well. Um, I guess the area that I, I would like to see more, uh, kind of nuance on is, um, you know, when you're, when you are a film critic and, and your criticism is an art, like writing, writing a film review is an art of mm -hmm. its own and not, every film critic is going to, f no one's going to focus on the exact same thing. Like every film critic has to find his, his or her way into the, you know, the piece that they're writing basically. So I'm trying to think of a way in which that can be, that sort of artistic need can, can be satisfied. And, to, and then of course they follow that train to its conclusion. They, they're bringing truth. They're revealing the truth about this work. Um, and also, you know, um, if if the point that they're they're dealing with isn't to do with the most morally objectionable aspect of a film, then there there would you know would, does there need to be some kind of like disclaimer or something added on to kind of just just so anybody who comes across it doesn't get the wrong impression that that you know it's yeah. it's, that, it's that kind of thing where it's like I think right. there needs to be some room for critics to kind of do their thing and yes. not all I think have to I be think I think it has a lot to do with the venue. 
of publication mm -hmm. in that case. Like I wouldn't expect necessarily expect that of a, I mean, well, here he is talking about the the moral issue of the setting the moral issue of the plots in its proper light. So he is talking about something more holistic here than just like singling out like there's a bad scene or they say a bad mm -hmm. word or something like that. Yeah. Which you know, certain yeah. things like I don't even talk about. Like I'm 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 mainly concerned about warning people about things that may be like a near occasion of sin for some people. Or mm -hmm. if a character takes if we discuss a film on this podcast where a character takes God's name in vain, like I'm not necessarily going to mention that. Yeah, I think I think like if you're writing for an academic audience or something, you don't necessarily need to like mention those things. I just think that like you were talking about the accessibility of information, but also like it goes sort of like both ways is like your your writing is accessible. Mm -hmm. So like you, you can't like assume who is and isn't like watching watching your stuff and also uh, or reading reading your stuff and also like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't even assume what people know because, like, formation is so poor in so many sectors, right? Like, yes. you can't even assume the same principles. Um, and I and I think, in fact, the reason that some Catholic film critics take a different approach is that they have different principles, right? I think we do have somewhat of a problem with, like, you can see this in public theology discussion, too, where, like, theology debates are about, like, really abstruse things are taking place on social media where they can be, like, misspoken or misunderstood by any number of, like, third-party viewers. Um, like... I think I think we kind of have an issue with like the accessibility of like certain high level discussions, right? Mm -hmm. Like it bothers me when like a writer, uh, even just in intellectual matters, like it bothers me sometimes if a writer will like invoke something, like he's writing sort of for a popular audience, but like he invokes something that's kind of like complex in a way that like doesn't do a serve that can like lead to confusion in his viewers. If you just sort of like invoke an idea and like leave it there without clarifying it. Mm -hmm. um, like I remember, you know, not to pick on Bishop Barron, but like what I remember he was um, early on in the fame of Jordan Peterson. He, he wrote something about Jordan Peterson and, and uh, he sort of positively invoked like Jordan Peterson's idea. And it, I mean, it's not just from Peterson, this idea basically that like, the fall was actually this like progress of like man into greater maturity, gaining knowledge. It was like a necessary sort of like it was a necessary step, mm -hmm. even though mm -hmm. it came with negatives, like this, this necessary step towards maturity as mm -hmm. opposed to like the child likeness of the garden. Mm -hmm. um, and he just kind of like mentioned this idea and like didn't really make clear whether he thought it was like right or wrong. And like that kind of thing bothers me mm. because it like you're you're living in this like sort of intellectual, you know, zone and like not thinking about how it might affect the reader who is not in that zone, you know. And so that's the kind of thing. I mean, I'm this is like a very broad issue, but like it's something that you have to keep in mind as a film critic. Right. And dealing mm. with like moral issues in films is that like, uh, in fact, like your average person isn't necessarily engaging with the film in the same way that you are, or they aren't necessarily kind of like able to look past the same things you look past, you know, setting us again, setting aside the idea of like your principles potentially being wrong or like you yourself not being like a sufficiently conscientious viewer, conscientious viewer, like mm -hmm. as a critic, you know, um, which, you know, certainly is the case uh, a lot of the time as well. But mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, those are a number of different thoughts on it, but I, th I think, I do think like the venue in the audience has a lot to do with that mm -hmm. and and whether you're doing a film review or like just a, an article about one that's very clearly just about one aspect of a film or you know something like that yeah i, I think like for me it, it hits home in the sense that i know when i'm watching a film often for me the the more specifically like film form related things or what i what i'm focusing on and i know that's that's to me that's an underexplored area in catholic film criticism so at the times when i do write you know uh, i would wouldn't call them reviews because they're barely that but i write some kind of feedback i'm usually focusing on the form and not so much on other aspects um and so i'm kind of wondering about how we can encourage like kind of that like to have like a full spectrum of critical like we should have a rich critical culture we should have yeah the best yeah. critical the best critical culture. well and you know the venues you, you write know? for nathan like a Substack or something like that are are the kinds of venues that are like not private venues but you know you're the people you can expect to be reading your work 
can like have a certain context and, and they sort of n- may, maybe know something about you or your values or, you know, or it's just, it's just more of a film critic audience reading your work. And so you can sort of, you know, you don't have to focus on certain things, but if you're writing for like a mainstream Catholic periodical, it might be different mm. or like, you know, this podcast is kind of niche, but it's also, it's a production for Catholic culture, which is, you know, a lot of people who aren't film buffs read it or, you know, you don't want to, there's the, there's the, there's the question of like misleading people. And there's also the question of like not scandalizing people, like not giving the impression mm. to people who are well-formed that like you are not advocating something bad or, um, and, uh, you know, this also sort of goes out on YouTube and people might see one episode and not get the context of all the other episodes we've done. And so there's certain things without being scrupulous that I, that I like feel the need to reiterate on any given film discussion. Um, but on the other hand, I do trust that like our, our listeners, like our regular listeners do have a context and then that there are certain things that I don't need to reiterate and I don't need to like hammer home all the time. And like I can, we can, if we took that, if we took sufficient time to discuss a particular moral issue in this film, then we don't need, need to necessarily discuss that length in the next film because we can say we already discussed this in a previous episode or and things like that. So, I, you know, it's obviously there's, there's a sort of like a, there's an intuition and like a prudence that goes into it as well with like knowing your audience or having a sense of, you know, what's appropriate. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So theater managers, um, all you there's theater a duty of conscience. Listen to that? this. I said, all you theater managers listening to this podcast, right? Now. Right. Yeah. So theater managers, um, I'm not even going to quote it. He says to theater managers, managers, well, he says there's a duty of conscience on the spectators that when you buy a ticket, you're, as it were, casting a vote for making a choice for good or bad movies. Um, now, that's a very general statement. I don't think that really gets into the particulars of like sort of cooperation with evil or something like that. He's making sort of a general economic point. Um, I don't think he's saying that you can't buy a ticket for like any morally imperfect film or something like that, because even like the Legion of Decency didn't operate on that, that logic. Right. Um, uh, and he says a similar duty binds those who manage theaters or distribute films quote, they are forbidden in conscience to present film programs, which are contrary to the faith and sound morals or to enter into contracts by which they are forced to present shows of this kind. Um, I think that's going to, again, evident to people who are listening to this podcast, but it's good to have that written on paper. Um, He also mentions movie posters. And this is kind of an interesting historical thing, because I think you actually this is actually maybe more of a problem at in the 50s than it is now, which is like these exploitative movie posters. And he says, like, even if the film itself is decent, oftentimes there will be like a sort of exploitative or like provocative movie poster, which might be immodest in some way or might be, you know, especially scandalous to like young people who see it or, or something like that. I just thought that that that's again, I think that's something that's kind of be obvious to good Catholics. But like it's it's interesting that that seemed I don't know what you think, Nathan, but it's that seems like more of a problem back in the day than it is now. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you definitely you don't you don't see it to the same extent. Yeah. And like that's that. partially maybe because um I don't know, movie posters back in the day were sort of like illustrated by artists who, I don't know, they might not have even seen the movie. (laughs) And it's just like, uh, now it tends to be like a picture, like a, not a still from the movie, but like kind of like it's the actors and, you know, they're kind of standing in a certain pose and it's like, it's just a different, occasionally you still do see suggestive posters or I think now more the issue is like disturbing or creepy or dark, like sort of a culty posters i think that's like more the thing that's going to give st- scandal to like a child walking by these days than like a, a super immodest you know movie poster yeah movie, movie posters and, and again we're talking culturally obviously we're dealing with north america but you know so there will be differences but um you know there there's a trend towards a certain economy you know like the, things are so minimalist nowadays mm. um which is which is interesting so uh yeah it's it's i think back then they were they were you know, they're, they're depending on stars to, to sell the movie. They still do today, but it's less, you know, less of a thing. Um, right. and so all the artists would need would be like a photograph of the star, maybe in, in the most attractive pose, a still frame from the film, 
Um, it's amazing how like there'll be films where there might be like one short scene on a beach or something <laughs> where the stars are in swimming attire and that ends up being like yeah. the image they use for yeah. the end. Well, from here to eternity is a great example, actually, you know, there's the famous yes. love scene on the beach. Uh, that's the poster of the movie forever now. You I mean, know, that's still what the part of the movie that people talk about too. Yeah. But, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, and you look at the, 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 when it's like a hand drawn, uh, painted poster, it's it's the same sort of thing you see in like old uh, like pulp paperback covers yes. of like you know Conan <laughs> books or whatever. It's it's that kind of thing, you know. Um, it's always like the like the hero and heroine in like the throes of love or <laughs> whatever. And, and I think like um, in in Italy, like you know the the Pope writing this is Italian. He's dealing with his local context. I'm pretty sure you could make the case that Italian movie posters are are very <laughs> of the time were very uh, you know out there they were very very much trying to draw people in through uh you know whatever means so yep 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 that's right and so then he has a little section a related section on catholic halls he says quote in cinema halls subject to ecclesiastical authority it is clear that only those films may be exhibited which are entirely beyond reproach now do we have a lot of catholic cinema halls no but we do have you know films being shown in parishes or we have pastors taking groups of people to see films or young adult groups being taken to see films. And I wouldn't even mention this section because it seems so obvious, but like I remember parish groups like taking people to see the Padre Pio movie, which turned out to be like really like obscene and blasphemous in one part. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if like the, they were aware that it was going to be that way, but like there's, there's there, you do see instances where people don't do their due diligence or, it was just a, a lack of sense of like responsibility or like optics. Like even if, even if you're seeing a movie that like all of the individuals going to see it can like licitly go to see, like they're mature enough to see it, even if it has some problems, whenever you're doing something like under the aegis of the church or like the parish, like it's different. It's even different from like a priest getting together, like a group of people like privately to watch mm -hmm. a film or, or something like that. Um, now, like, again, how that sheds light on, like, the Vatican film list and some of the picks on that, you know, I'll just leave for, like, the viewers, like, to decide. <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah. So at least as far as Catholic cinema, cinema hall, halls are concerned, like, there is a certain propriety and, like, avoidance of scandal that has to be uh, observed. Mm -hmm. um, so finally, the section on actors... I'll read the passage on actors. He says, actors, quote, remembering their dignity as human beings and as experienced artists should know that they are not permitted to lend their talents to parts in plays or to be connected with the making of films which are contrary to sound morals. Um, and, uh, and then he says that famous actors should, uh, in fact, use their, their renown uh, in order to inspire the mind of the public with noble sentiments and to give a good example of virtue in their private life. I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of the, the bit about you can't be connected with the making of films which are contrary to sound morals. I don't think that means you can't be connected to the making of like imp imperfect, morally imperfect films. I think he's talking about like the film overall. Um, I, I think they're like, I, that's worth considering. Like, why do I, why would I want to be in this film? Even if my own part I'm not having to do or say anything bad. Like, why would I want to be part of this overall project that is bad? I, I think like there's probably room for like a detailed moral analysis of like people who are basically like professionals, like just trying to like earn a living. Like if you're uh, I know that like a Catholic grip cannot light like a sex scene, obviously, for mm -hmm. instance. But if you're like, you know, if you're working on a movie on the whole that you don't agree with, like what it says, <laughs> if you basically just like have to do it to feed your family as like a, you know, a car, a set carpenter or something, like I'm not sure where that all breaks mm -hmm. down. I've always been glad that I wasn't an actor <laughs> for this reason because it's like a really yeah, tough. It's tough. It's like yeah. a tough road to hoe when choosing work, and uh, you know, as a musician, I was rarely put into those positions. There were only a couple of positions where I was like doing like one off playing with like a pop cover group or something. And I had to think about like, what are the lyrics of this particular song? And in most cases it didn't even like really end up coming to that. Mm. Um, I think I, I think I played one gig where like I was playing with a band that was like backing up a rapper at some like event at an art gallery. 
There was like one line that was like very obscene in this rapper's song, which I did. I don't think I even like realized that until like the gig was already like sort of coming up and I had already basically committed to do it. But if I remember correctly, I kind of like either dropped out or I just like played something like really awkward on the keyboard <laughs> like while the rapper was saying that line just to like register like a very like subtle like Protest. I don't agree with this in, mu- <laughs> in musical terms. But that's the like the only situation I had to uh, had to deal with that. But yeah, for actors, it's I think it's a tough, you know, for a struggling actor to have to deal with those things. Um, yeah. And if I, you're working I, in Holly- I, Hollywood. I think we can't underestimate as well the cumulative effect. Like, um, you know, someone might be able to make the justification for, you know, oh, I'm only contributing functionally to a small part of this, uh, on one occasion. But the thing is that if that's repeated over and over, you know, eventually that's going to, someone's conscience is going to have to really, uh, address that. And I've, um, this isn't to do with actors. Like, you know, we both know, uh, other, friends who work in film who, you know, I think I've expressed this in the past about kind of the kinds of projects that you get asked to do and you want to say yeah. yes, cause you got to keep saying yes to network and to, to keep, you know, cl- you know, building up your, um, your base of contacts. It's really hard to say no, even, even if the project, you know, maybe isn't like the worst project ever, but it's obviously got some dodgy stuff going on. You know, it's, it's hard to say no to that. Um, especially if your role isn't, isn't like the most creative, role on the film but i think it is it's even more pronounced you know for actors for for directors for producers for cinematographers people who are really really in the mix and you know part of their art is giving like there's the person not that you know a set dresser carpenter or whatever isn't giving of him or herself Mm -hmm. in their work but definitely something is not being required of their artistic consciousness of the kind of like personal personalized nature of that to the same degree. Like they're not really determining like the direction or, or some key aspect right. of the film to the same degree. So I think, I think maybe one way to think about it is, is um, those who are required to really kind of bring the film or the, the desire of the film into themselves in order to actualize it. Um, you know, there has to be kind of a, there has to be an em- empathization uh, an empathy, you know, for what the film is trying to accomplish. That's right. really hard to do, um, you know, if it's contrary to, to your morals. Um, I think that's where this ends up for a lot of people, you know, is, is trying to make that, that is it worth the trade off, you know, or, uh, a lot of people get in the position of accepting kind of, you know, this much, but not this much, but right. You know, it's, it's a really tricky situation. And and as far as the cumulative aspect, I mean, this is a question with like, even just art, your, your artistic choices of work as well, which is like, so like, why did I get into this in the first place? Like, is this like, if you, if you keep having to do this to make a living is like, am I just doing this to make a living or am I doing this for like artistic reasons? And the same with like the, the moral, uh, aspect. Um, and I also think that like it's kind of like climbing the ladder in politics because because, mm-hmm. you know, the justification might be like, OK, I'm doing this to make a ladder. It's, sorry, I'm doing this to make money and I'm doing this to like make my name. And then at a certain point, I'll like have the artistic like wherewithal and like the clout to like do the things that I want to do. Uh, and obviously, when it comes to like just doing stuff that you're not artistically passionate about, like that's a great like justification, especially given that you can like learn and develop your craft on those mm-hmm. things. Um, but uh, when it comes to like moral compromises, as in politics, you form yourself in a in a certain way, and like that day never comes, you know. Or often yeah. enough, like you don't even get that you don't even get that clout, and then now you, what are you left with, like whales or whatever? So, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I think that's very common. The other thing he says to actors is that they may not quote accept from their audience expressions of praise which savor of a type of idolatry, since in this case also our Savior's words apply, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Um, So actors, he's saying, you know, uh, that it's not necessarily wrong to be in a position where you're receiving praise as an actor because your work moved people, but uh, you have to direct that towards God, basically. So that's all uh, That's all we have to highlight in terms of Miranda Persis. 
any other I just, comments? I just want to add one more thing because in the next section is producers and directors. So, I mean, this hits home <laughs> for me, kind of the gravity of, um, you know, just the sort of fatherly reminder that he, he gives saying, he says, the heaviest responsibility, though for a different reason from, from actors, the heaviest responsibility, though for a different reason, falls on directors and producers. Um, uh, and then, you know, as is obvious, he goes on to explain that's because, you know, we are the ones who are most responsible for the formation, you know, of, of the work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a sobering reminder of kind of the, the, the call, you know, of like the, the, the power that you kind of wield in this kind of work. Um, but also the, and the responsibility and the, the call that comes with it. It's not yours just to play with. If you, if you're pursuing this path, you know, you have a high, there's a high dignity to that calling, um, which as this doc, as, as the ideal, ideal film goes into talking about is, is tied up again with respect for the dignity of man. Um, so it's something, I guess it's maybe like all great things in life. It's a responsibility to wear, um, soberly, but not to be, you know, weighed down by or crushed by, um, I just appreciate the, the fatherly kind of encouraging, but also serious admonition <laughs> involved. So, all right. So that's it for Pius the 12th. We do recommend that, uh, readers who are interested, go and read the whole document on the ideal film in particular. And we've got one more episode in this series on church teaching on cinema, which will cover, um, sort of, I don't know, Vatican II, among other things, I guess. Uh, we'll, we'll figure that out uh, before the next episode. But uh, for now, uh, we'll thank our listeners for, for joining us and hope this, uh, hope this was enlightening in some way. And uh, thank you, Nathan, for being with me again. Thanks for having me, Thomas. Always a pleasure. Criteria is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Jim Papandrea, Catholic Culture audiobooks bringing to life classic Catholic writings, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical resources, and much more at catholicculture.org. <laughs>